told wife I was going to start with this, and she said not to. So let's be fair. That's my disclaimer. Uh, there are three good reasons not to get married. I just want you to know there's at least three. There's probably a lot more from people who've been married more than eight years. I mean, some of you have been married 29, Ralph. Is that what we got? 29? Okay. I'm 29. That means you've been married as long as I've been alive. Um, okay. <laughs> Three good reasons not to get married from someone who knows very little about marriage. Okay. One, don't get married if you're already married. Think about it. If you're already married, don't get married. Doesn't work well for you. Two, don't get married if you don't want to get married. Three, don't get married if you have no intention of being faithful. We are going through the second part of this book. I told you about it. This is how to share Jesus, and it uses page numbers. So you don't even need to know books of the Bible. You give this to somebody, you look at it with them, you study, and the Lord provides the increase. Beautiful story. But we go back to the same question that we started with last week. What if the Lord were to come right now? Would you know for sure, nothing doubting, that you would go to heaven? We talk about how the Bible says that you may know that you have eternal life. And we know that we are talking about how eternal life is only found in Christ. And we ended the question, how do we obey the gospel? This week, we're going to take that a little bit further because I introduced those three reasons not to get married. Did you know there's actually good reasons not to be joined to Christ? They're the same. If you've already got another God, don't try to share with God. He doesn't care for that, right? Two, if you don't actually want to be saved, don't fake it. And three, if you're not willing to be faithful we'll see today that it's worse than not getting connected to God the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We're starting with the terms. There is good reason to want to get married. And when I talk about marriage, I am not talking about another person. God refers to idolatry as adultery for a reason. Because we are the bride of Christ. We are married. We are making a commitment to God. And right here he presents one of the best regions too. Is that you are still under God's wrath. Because God hates sin. He is so perfect, so holy, that he looks at us and he can't say anything but be gone. Everlasting destruction. So we ask then, what is this gospel? Because it said, those who do not obey the gospel. So we look at this gospel reenacted. Or do you not know that as many of us, as we're baptized into Christ Jesus... We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, but God be thanked that through you were, though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. In this we have it again presented, and it is positive, positive, positive. And there are so many reasons too. And what we're kind of dealing today with is more than anything, the reasons. 
He, he calls us to reenact the most greatest thing that changed the whole history of the world. That one thing that nothing had happened before that could compare with it, nothing will happen in the future that will compare with it. And it is that resurrection, that saving grace that comes only through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so we present to you once again, there are great reasons. We see it again in Galatians. For you're all sons of God. Wow. Did you hear that one? He just called me his son. Did you hear it? That's beautiful. He calls me his child. Let's hear it again. For you're all sons of God. Wow. Through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You are in Christ. One more good. We're talking about those reasons. We started with good reasons to get married to God, to be joined to God, to become one with God through baptism. But Jesus doesn't present one side. He really doesn't. He doesn't say everything about coming to him is good because I gave you three reasons not to get married. And there's some of the same reasons we're going to look at not to actually come to God. Don't come to Christ. God. Half hearted. Don't come to God. If you've already got a God in his place. And you have no way of getting rid of it. Come to God. Knowing that if one becomes a Christian. Will they first face persecution. Jesus said it in these words. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant, that's us, is not greater than our master. That's him. If they persecuted him, they will also persecute us. He presents the full gambit. He says, consider this cost. He, he gives us challenges and says, Consider it first. Consider the reward, which is great and it is eternal. But that doesn't mean the price still doesn't have to be paid. Just because the price is cheap does not make the price easy. If I told you a billion dollars, that's a lot of money. But if I was selling you the United States, all the land and the minerals and the sky and everything here for a billion dollars, is that cheap? Yes. Yes. But is it still a billion dollars? Yeah, still a billion dollars. It doesn't make it any less a billion dollars. It doesn't make it any less a cost. Now, is it cheap? Yes. You're getting all of heaven. That's better than the land and the minerals and everything here. But he still says these challenging words. Christ said, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers, sisters. Yes, his own life also. He cannot, cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. I talked about that. Don't get married if you know that you have no intention of being faithful. If you come to God and you say, yes, I want to be in you, and you get buried with him and united with Christ, and you go back and reject him. God compares it to trampling underfoot the Son of God. He talks about how there is no hope. But he gives us this hard. He says, if you have another God, don't come get me. If you're already married, don't get married again. And this he's saying, whatever is in your life that is more important than God, you cannot be my disciple. If you love your mother and father so much that you can't follow me fully, you can't be my disciple. If you love your family, if you love your life more than me, you can't be my disciple. What he's saying is, if you are married to something, you can't get married again. You can't say, yes, you can be God. Just share with the other ones. 
I've got a shelf of my gods, you're one of them. Doesn't work. Count that cost. Say, am I willing to give up my life, which is a cheap price to pay for a life of eternity, isn't it? But it's still a life. My family, which is a cheap price to pay for an eternity with him in his family, living with him in heaven. But it's still a price. It's not as though it's free because it's cheap. John said it in such a way that it makes it very hard. Has anyone ever told you it's better not to come to Christ if you have no intention of following him? But that's exactly what we get in God's word. He says it's better. Just skip it. If you're not intending to be married fully to God, it's better if you don't. If you're coming to God saying, I'm going to cheat on you. I'm not going to give my life to you. He says it in some harsh words. When God gave these words to John. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled then, and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Ow. It, this is hard because this is something that's so often avoided, but it brings us back to that. The cost is cheap in comparison to what we get, but it's not free. It, it's not as though we get to say, yes, you're, you're God, nothing changes. It's as though you say, you're God. That changes everything. You're my Lord. That makes me your servant. That makes me able to follow you. But he says this, if we join to him and we cling to the world, he says, don't even cling to him. They, they used to talk about soldiers in the mid, middle of ages when the Catholic Church was, they're, they're very anti-war. And they didn't believe anybody who was baptized should be a soldier in war. So what they would do was they would be baptized with their arm in the air holding their sword. What they were doing was very symbolic. They were clinging, weren't they? There was something to them that was not worth giving up. And so what happened? They were baptized minus that arm, right? So that their arm could continue to serve the world. And that's what they were doing. They were married to the world and trying to be married to God. None of us would actually consider going up to our wife and going, Honey, I'm thinking about getting married. Oh, sweet, we're going to renew our vows. No, someone else. Well, you're divorcing me? No, 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 I'm, I'm going to keep you. It's okay. I'm going to hold on to you, hold on to her. We're going to keep them. It's going to be a good relationship. You know, like, that, that doesn't actually sound smart, does it? I'm going to get hit. And my wife is a very rash woman. I'm pretty sure she can knock me out. And there's a chance I'm getting that. And we understand the humor. And there's humor in how foolish that is when it comes to doing it to my wife. And we see that emotion there. And then we look at God and we're like, oh, let me cling to this and cling to you. Is it okay, God, if I have a second wife? That's okay, right? That's okay if I have another God, right? I'm not saying God's going to punch you in the face. I don't know that he had have physical hands to do it. But we kind of get that extreme answer, don't we? Because look at it. He's saying, if you're clinging to me, clinging to the world, that's, that's worse than just not clinging to me. Your end state is one, a waste. Now, we've talked about some good reasons. To be in God. We've talked about some bad reasons. That, that say, you know, if you're going to come to God this way, don't do it. It's one of those where it, it would almost be easier if some of this wasn't in the Bible. 
And if it's all this just free concept of, you know, come to me and it doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. But I didn't write the Bible. We, we don't get to choose what's in the Bible. We don't get to come to God on our terms. We don't get to decide how God judges us. We get to come to Him, His way, and do His will. So we've presented one, positive reasons, negative reasons. But there's so many times that there's other reasons. And we have to deal with it. And it's just one of those that, why? Why are there ever other reasons? Because the thing is, it's all going to come back to one of those two. If I say, you are willing to give up anything, mother, father, brother, sister, right? Well, even your own life. Then tell me the things you wouldn't do if you wanted God as your Lord. Tell me where I could find a third reason. Could I? Because I've heard some crazy reasons over the year. How many of y'all know my wife's afraid of water? I don't know. I thought she could float. I don't know. I can float. I thought she could float. She's afraid of water. But if you ask her why she got baptized, she'll tell you the truth. She said, I gave my life and everything. Does that mean she goes, okay, I'm coming to God, except I'm afraid, so therefore I'm going to step back. Well, you know what I just cling to? I cling to something I didn't even want to cling to. Fear. Didn't I? My fear became more important than my God. Now, it could be more extreme. She's not deathly afraid of it. But if she's deathly afraid of it, then you have to go back to that same scripture. What did it say that you had to be willing to give up to be his disciple? Life, right? And if you're willing to give up your life and you're deathly afraid of water, then guess what? You're really willing to give up your life. If you have a fear that is so strong that you really feel going in there, you may not come out then you get to finally ask yourself a question. Am I ready to give God my life? Whew. I've heard others. I mean, baptisms at 2 a.m. because people were afraid of people seeing them. Okay. I, th these are valid things that people feel. And so you have to come back to that same scripture. We have to go back to that same scripture. Is looking foolish less than your life? Is it? Is looking foolish less than your life? Because he makes it pretty clear. If God's not more important than your life, then you really can't come to him. Because you're asking him to be your other wife, and that doesn't work. But in reality, most of us have reasons that we don't do what we should do. And you, you may not, you may be baptized, you may be. And I don't want to exclude you from this just because you're baptized. There may be something that you're holding on to so much so that he can't be God anymore. And, and no matter what it is, is it less than your life? Because I, I don't know your, your personal situation. I, uh, I love studying people who have had to go through hard things to come to God. There was, there was a Jewish woman who lived through the Holocaust. And, and she read this scripture and it tore at her so bad that she fought for years coming to God. Because you know what God told her she had to do? She had to forgive. Now, I, I've never been in a situation where I'd have to forgive my captor who has tortured me and was probably going to kill me. And she struggled for years to come to God because she knew that God demanded her life. And in that, he told her to forgive her enemies, which was less than her life, wasn't it? That seems like a good reason to her, okay? But in this, we keep going back. In our lives, do we come to God and then return?
Is this the state we return to? Do we become so entangled with the world that, okay, we gave up the world, we went to God, we clung to God, we got our husband. That's what he calls himself. He's the, we are the bride. He's the husband. We come to him, we have our husband, and then we go what? Let me bring that world back in. Let me bring that world back in, and it talks about this. Our end state is worse than when we began. This is, this is hard, and it should be hard, because the price is cheap, but it's not free. And it's only cheap in comparison to what we get. Because if I ask for your life, I'm asking a lot from you. But when God offers you in exchange this life, this twisted world of sin and suffering and sorrow and misery and death and darkness and decay and our bodies breaking down. And he says, you, you can keep that if you'd like. I, I'm a loving God who will not force myself on anyone. Or, or you can take that life, give me what it's worth, and I'll give you life to the full. And I will give you an eternity with him in heaven. And too many of us have reasons. And I want you to see our reasons in light. Because there's way too many of us who don't get the full joy of the Lord. Who don't get to experience what God intended for us to have. You hear it often, you hear, but if I gave up the world and it's sin and doing all those things I want to do and came to God. I'd have to give up all that fun stuff. Now, which is the fun part? Disease, sickness, death. Which was the fun part of sin? I could never figure it out. I think it's the, the picture. It's like the brochure. You know, come to the Grand Canyon. It's really a really hot spot in the desert. You really, I mean, come look at a hole in the ground. Okay, but they got a nice picture, right? And you see the picture and you're like, I want to go to the Grand Canyon and see a hole in the ground. Now, if I, I, I show a picture of a hole in the ground and I'm like, you want to come see it? There's a hole in the yard. It's right here. It's a real pretty circle. But you tell me that's not exactly how sin works. Sin shows us this beautiful picture of this. Woo, look, it's the Grand Canyon. They even give it the word grand. Okay, it's a big hole in the ground. Got it. Grand hole in the ground. But it's that picture. The picture of sin looks good. It does. It looks good to do what I want. To experience pleasure that is temporary. It looks good to go, oh, you know what? It would be fun to cheat on my wife. Wait a minute. It looks good, doesn't it? It looks good because I'm offered that taste. It's like chocolate cake. I'm going to have to work for a week for that chocolate cake. But it tastes good, doesn't it? Tell me I don't like chocolate cake. I love chocolate cake. Give me some German chocolate cake. Oh, okay. And that's a picture I get, right? I don't think that it's just, you know, lard and fat and sugar and everything else I'm really not going to enjoy in a week. I'm not going to feel good. I'm going to have this sugar high and then crash. I'm going to sleep through the sermon too. It's okay. But when we look at it, that's, that's how we need to make sure and see this. We do. We, we've come to God. Many of us have come to God. If you have not, there's no good reason. The, the, the picture of sin is not the reality of sin, is it? We, we, don't, we don't get what we go after when we go after sin. What we get is this very, very temporary joy and then a life of suffering. Hospice talks about different things that people talk about on their deathbed. There's a man who, who cheated on his wife. That's why I brought it up, because I heard it just this week. He cheated on his wife, kept it from his wife his whole life. As though he didn't have any of the consequences, and it ate away at him until the day he died. He said, 20-something 20 20 years ago, I cheated on my wife. She never found out. Nothing bad came of it, except that it ate away at him his whole life. And on his deathbed, 
He wanted more than anything to tell his wife that he cheated on her. He was in hospice. His wife was dead. He had no way to tell his wife. And if you would have asked him, is the brochure look like the real thing? You know he's going to tell you no. Because it, it obviously looked good up front, but once he did it, he suffered his whole life for it. There were no consequences. His wife never found out. But there were consequences because inside he was suffering and couldn't tell anyone. And at the point he was ready to tell somebody, they were gone. So when we say it's not free, but it's cheap, that's the kind of things we're giving up. We're giving up those things that look good on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. Christ has described their good deeds as beautiful whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. And yes, our lives are beautiful whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. And we are then challenged with something. Acts is very good about asking him point straight out and just leaving it there. And now, why are you waiting? This is what we've been talking about, right? Why are you waiting? Why are you waiting to fully serve God? Why are you waiting to be in Christ? Why are you waiting to be God's? Why are you waiting to have that possessive be yours where you're like, I belong to him. I, I'm God's. He, he owns me. You know, you know who my uh, father is? <laughs> you know who my father is? Yeah, because he, he, even though I was nothing, let me be his. So he asked this about our reason. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In our invitation, obviously, if you are not baptized into Christ and you say that he means you want him to be your Lord, your reasons are bad. Because that pretty picture isn't worth it. So today, having heard the word, having believed that Jesus is Lord, having repented of our sins, knowing that we are sinful and asking for his forgiveness, Having confessing Jesus as Lord, being buried with him in baptism so we can walk in newness of life as his children on our way to heaven, trading this filth for something beautiful. Or if there's somebody who has not been married to God, you've been married to other things, and you know that there's sin separating you because you're holding on to something when God needs to be your Lord. Or if there's somebody who just wants to be Submit to the eldership here and be joined with this family here. We ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.